In this our third study, we are going to look at the beast, the dragon, and the woman. We will be looking at the book of Revelation, the thirteenth chapter, and finding out more about this little horn power. We saw in our previous study that Daniel had a dream, which enlarged and built upon the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. We saw that the head of gold, Babylon, was also represented by a lion. We learnt that the Persians were stronger than the Medes, and that the bear which was raised up on one side represented this. The three ribs in the mouth of the bear represented the fact they had overthrown Egypt, Libya and Babylon. We saw the leopard with four heads that represented Greece, and the wings represented the swiftness of Alexander the Great in conquering the Medes and the Persians. And lastly we looked at the dragon beast and the rise of the little horn that was different from the other ten. In Revelation, the thirteenth chapter, we have a beast that has seven heads and ten horns, and over the years it has been said that this beast represented different individuals. Some people have said that this beast represents Adolf Hitler. But when finding that Adolf Hitler passed off the scene of action, then people began to say, well, this beast represents Russia, and they applied it to Russia for many years. And then Russia, of course, changed, and now today you will hear people saying it's a computer over in Brussels. Now, God wants you and I to understand what he's talking about. People say they can't understand the book of Revelation, but God promises a special blessing to people that read this last book of the Bible. And I hope we find a blessing as we study together. Chapter 1 of Revelation reads, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. The scripture says that if you and I are willing to pick up God's word and read Revelation, he will bless us. He goes on to say that it's not just enough to read it, but we have to read what it has to say, take note of it, not let it go in one ear and out the other. We have to hear what it says. Then it says, Blessed is the person who keeps those things that are written in the book. If we are willing to open up God's word and to read it carefully, prayerfully, then God says that you and I will be able to understand what it's talking about. So, let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and see what it has to say about this beast that has seven heads and ten horns. And I stood on the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads the name of Blasphemy. Now God takes us step by step and shows us points by which we can identify this beast. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And from our last study this should ring some bells with you. And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Now we begin to see some similarity here. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all peoples and languages and nations. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man has an ear, let him hear. Now listen carefully. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. 
Now in the text that we have read from verse 1 through to verse 10, you find that God gives us seven points of identification so that we can identify exactly who the beast is. We don't have to be in any doubt about who the chapter of Revelation 13 is made up of, who it represents. So let's take a look at these seven points. To begin with, we find this beast in Revelation 13 is made up of the four beasts of Daniel 7. Remember this beast? In Daniel 7, we talked about the lion. It said that this beast in Revelation 13 had the feet of a bear, and we've talked about the bear, which is Medo-Persia. It said that it had the body of a leopard, and remember we talked about the leopard in Daniel 7. It said that the dragon gave to it its power, its seat, and its authority. So we find that this beast in Revelation 13 is made up of those four beasts in Daniel 7, because there are some definite similarities here. But it continues on, and it says concerning this beast, it says that the dragon would give it its power, its seat, and its authority. Now when it talks about the dragon, you remember that we had a dragon in Daniel 7, and we also had a dragon in Revelation 12, a great red dragon. And we are going to look at this dragon and identify it, because it says that it is this dragon that gives its power, its seat, and its authority to this beast in Revelation 13. So let's see what it has to say about this dragon. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. So here it's speaking of this woman who is clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Goes on to say that she brings forth a child. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. So here is this dragon of Revelation 12. It has seven heads and ten horns. Now let's look at this beast in Revelation 13. Again we see that it has seven heads and ten horns. So are you seeing some similarities here? The dragon in Revelation 12 and 13 both have seven heads and ten horns. But it goes on speaking of this and says, And his tail, referring to the dragon, drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So here is this dragon standing before the woman, ready to devour her child. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So it tells us that the woman gave birth to a child that was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and then was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Are you seeing something here? In our previous study, we found out about the one thousand two hundred and sixty days, times, times and a dividing of times. Here it is again, 1,260 days. It says that the woman was going to flee into the wilderness for that period of time. Now any time you are studying Bible prophecy, Old or New Testament, it will stay consistent. In Bible prophecy, a woman will always represent a church. That's always true. Sometimes God pictures a good woman, like the one we have just studied in Revelation 12, which represents a good church. And sometimes you'll find that he presents a woman that is a bad woman, meaning a bad church, as in Revelation 17, but it always represents a church. As for instance, it says in Jeremiah, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Jesus says that when he comes back, he is coming back after his bride. He is referred to as a bridegroom, so the woman represents a church. This represents a church because it says she was clothed with the sun and the moon was under her feet, and on her head was a crown of twelve stars. The sun represented the gospel as it would come forth from Jesus Christ in all of its glory. That's why it says she's clothed with the sun. 
The moon under her feet represented the Old Testament that she was coming out of, the Old Testament dispensation, and the crown of twelve stars on her head represented the twelve disciples that God had given the commission to take the gospel to the world. But let us continue on. And she brought forth a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. There has only ever been one child born that was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and was caught up to God and his throne, and that child was Jesus Christ. So this is talking about the birth of Jesus. But it says that this great red dragon stood before the woman ready to devour her child just as soon as it was born. I think that all of you know the Christmas story. You remember that the wise men were looking for the Christ child. Now it says, speaking of the dragon, And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Remember the wise men arrive at Jerusalem, and they were inquiring about this child that was to be born a king, so much so that the scripture says it upset the whole city. King Herod got to hear of it, and he called in the wise men, and asked them who they were looking for, and they said, We're looking for this child that is to be born, we have seen the star, the sign of him, and we're looking for this child that is to be born a king. Herod asked where he was to be born, and they didn't know. So Herod called in the scribes, and he asked them where the child was to be born, and they said, He is to be born down in Bethlehem. So Herod told the wise men to go down to Bethlehem, and when they had found the child, to come and tell him, because he would also like to go and worship him. When the wise men got down to Bethlehem, they found the child and worshipped him. They gave him their gold, frankincense and myrrh. The scripture then says that an angel told those wise men to go back another way, because Herod sought the child's life. That same angel told Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt. So when it says that this dragon stood before the woman ready to devour the child as soon as it was born, it was referring to the power of the Romans. You remember when Herod found out that he had not been told, he had all the male children, two years of age and under, killed. Herod used the power of pagan Rome. So when it talks about this great red dragon, it's referring to pagan Rome. We found out in our previous study that the dragon in Daniel 7 was also pagan Rome. So you see the consistency of scripture. Now once again we see this dragon in Revelation 12 is pagan Rome. And it says that it stood before the woman ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. Now the point you need to look at here is the fact that it says that this dragon, pagan Rome, would give to this beast of Revelation 13 its power, its seat and its authority. That's what we have to look at. That's what it says would happen. Scripture then goes on to say, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns and on his heads the name of blasphemy. Here this beast of Revelation 13 had seven heads. Now as we go into our study, step by step we will identify every one of those heads. This becomes important because as we get down to the end of Revelation, the 17th chapter, it makes these heads very important. Listen to what it says about it. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Now here's another beast in Revelation 17 that has seven heads and ten horns. So now we have three different beasts that have seven heads and ten horns. We have a dragon in Revelation 12. The dragon has seven heads and ten horns. In Revelation 13 we have a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. And also in Revelation 17 we have a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. Scripture is very consistent, and once you understand what it's talking about, it just opens up and you are able to understand and see things that are happening and taking place. 
Let's go on and see what it says about this beast in Revelation 17. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and there are seven kings. So it tells us clearly that those seven heads are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. So it's going to be absolutely necessary that you and I identify exactly each one of these heads, because then we can start to put it together and understand what it's talking about. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Here it tells us that those ten horns are ten kings. Now we need to put certain things together, because remember, as we have studied, we have talked about Daniel, the second chapter, and the image. And you remember it had ten toes, and it said that those ten toes were ten kings. Remember, it said in the days of those kings the God of heaven would set up a kingdom. So that image has ten toes, representing ten kings. When we got to the fourth beast of Daniel 7, the dragon, it said that it had ten horns. And it said that those ten horns were ten kings. You remember we found out they're the same. Now here, in Revelation the thirteenth chapter, this fourth beast has ten horns. And it tells us that they are ten kings, and all those represented Western Europe. Remember these were the Goths. We studied this, the Germanic people that came down and broke the Roman Empire up into ten parts. Those are the ten kings, and it says that those ten kings will figure in a very definite way down here at the end of time. Because it says that these kings have received no kingdom as yet. So you see, we are beginning to put down points to identify this beast of Revelation 13. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things, and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. So it tells you that this beast in Revelation 13 was going to last a definite period of time, 42 months. Now, we told you that as we studied that certain things will begin to happen, and we talked about this last time. I want you to listen to this statement from history because it's part of what we told you the last time we studied. Bishop Silverius of Rome had been elected under the Gothic influence. Belisarius, this is Justinian's general, was besieged in Rome by the Goths. Silverius was accused of favouring the Goths. Now Silverius was a godly man. He loved the people, he served the people, and he loved the Lord. But Justinian and Belisarius felt that he leaned towards the Goths. So in 537, remember this date, 537, Silverius was banished by Belisarius. He was actually executed by Balzarius in 538. So he was banished in 537 and executed in 538 AD. And the deacon Vigilius was then elected Pope. It is likely that Justinian never thought of Vigilius as anything more than a docile head of Department of Religion and the Imperial Government and intended to keep the reins all the more firmly in his own hands. Vigilius, owing his pontificate to imperial influence and bolstered by this new legal recognition of the Pope's ecclesiastical supremacy, marked the beginning of a long climb toward political power, which culminated in the reigns of such popes as Gregory the Seventh, Innocent the Third, and Boniface the Eighth. From this time on, the popes are more involved in worldly events, no longer belonging solely to the Church. They are men of the state, and then rulers of the state. So here we see that something begins to happen here. All of a sudden, the Bishop of Rome, who had been the head of the church, now all of a sudden finds himself not just the head of the church, but as the head of state. And you have the beginning of what history refers to as Papal Rome, when Justinian took Vigilius and placed him on the seat as the Bishop of Rome in 538 AD. History makes this statement. It says that the Bishop of Rome 
stepped to the seat of Caesar and seized the scepter in 538 AD. Now watch very carefully. It says that this power that we are talking about is going to rule for 42 months. Okay, 538 AD is when the Papal Rome came into existence. If we take the scripture where it says, I have appointed thee a day for a year. Now, in your Bible, you have to go back to the scripture and let it interpret itself. You'll find that in the Bible there are 30 days in a month, 360 days in a biblical year. And if you go to Genesis, the 7th and 8th chapter, where it talks about the flood, you will see that it all lines up very nicely for you. It's very, very clear. So if I've got 42 months and I multiply that 42 months by 30, it gives me 1,260 days. And the scripture says that a day represents a year here in Bible prophecy. So I have here 1,260 years. Now it says that that power is going to be in control. Now I'm talking about identification. I'm talking about identifying that power so that you and I don't have to be in any doubt about it. It makes it very clear that it's going to rule for 1,260 years. So it came into power in 538 AD. Therefore, if I'm going to add 1,260 years to it, it is going to take me to the date of 1798 AD. 538 AD to 1798 AD, Papal Supremacy. Now, if Scripture is correct, if the Bible is divine, if God says that you and I need to heed what it says in the Bible prophecy, then what I'm telling you is that something had to happen in 1798. So, let's see if indeed it did. And it was given to him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all peoples and languages and nations. Now we've said before that any time when you find in history that a church has been put into a position where it has state power, and it controls, it rules, any time that has happened, and it's never failed, you have always had persecution. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Catholics having state power or the Protestants having state power. Any time any church has ever received state power, it has persecuted. That has always happened. An historical statement says this, talking about how they felt back then. Morally, they believed themselves to be saving thousands of souls by burning a single heretic. Now they believed that what they taught was right, and therefore they thought that everybody that didn't believe that way was wrong, that they were a heretic. And they said if we burn them, we are going to save thousands. Politically, they believed it possible, by sufficient, persistent and ruthless persecution, to extinguish heresy altogether. And thus you find in history some things that you wish were not there. You read about the massacre of St. Bartholomew, where they slew 60,000 Huguenots one Sunday morning. You read about the Spanish Inquisition, the Inquisition of the Dutch, the persecution of the Waldensian people. All you have to do is go and pick up some books, such as Fox's Book of Martyrs, Short's Short Stories of the Reformation, here I Stand by Bateman History of Europe History of the Reformation by Daubigny Historians will tell you that during this 1260 years, somewhere between 100 and 150 million people perished, died. So when it said it would persecute, indeed, it has done just that. But then it says, and I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. You remember that beast had seven heads and ten horns. And John said, As I looked at it, I saw one of those heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Well, let's see what happens. You see, there's a revolution going on over in France. Napoleon has come to power just as scripture had predicted. Let's see what Revelation 13 has to say. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. 
He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This power that has taken the reign of church and state and put it together has persecuted, it has killed with the sword. Therefore scripture has predicted that it should die by the sword. Napoleon has risen up. In France there has been the French Revolution. The age of reason has come into play and people have rebelled against the rule of papal Rome. Napoleon knows that he cannot control Europe unless he can break the back of the papal power. He knows that, and so he sets out to do just that. Napoleon sends his general, Berthier, to Rome on February the 15th, 1798. General Berthier marched into Rome and took the Pope prisoner, and papal Rome came to an end in 1798. The Pope was taken prisoner, taken back to France where he died in prison, just exactly as scripture said. It said he would receive a deadly wound and that it would last for 42 months, or 1,260 years. That 1,260 years came to an end in 1798, just exactly as the Bible foretold it came to an end. But it doesn't stop there. And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So scripture has said that this beast who received the wound in 1798, it has said that the wound was going to be healed, and that's in the process today, it's beginning to happen. And as we study we're going to show you certain things that are happening right at this present time, in which it shows that the deadly wound is being healed. Here's a statement made by Gorbachev, this is what he says, this was written in the Toronto Star. Now it can be said that everything which took place in Eastern Europe in recent years would have been impossible without the Pope's efforts and his enormous role, including the political role which he played in the world arena. Pope John Paul II will play an enormous political role now that profound change has occurred in European history. So certain things are falling into place today in which it is saying that this beast that received the deadly wound, that the deadly wound is going to be healed. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now if you take a look at these heads, we can begin to put them together, because as we have studied so far, we have found this out. We found out that we had the image from Daniel 2, you remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The head of gold was Babylon. And the lion in Daniel 7, that was one head, the head of the lion. On the image the arms and chest of silver was made of Persia, and in Daniel 7 the bear was also made of Persia, that's the second head, the head of the bear. Then we came to the belly and the thighs of brass, on the image of Daniel 2, and in Daniel 7 it was a leopard, that's the third head, the head of the leopard. And then we came to the legs of iron on the image of Daniel 2, and the dragon in Daniel 7, which was pagan Rome. Here is the fourth head. You remember when we studied Daniel 7, there were ten horns, and the statue of Daniel 2 had ten toes. The beast, the dragon of Daniel 7, had ten horns. The image had ten toes, which were ten kings. The dragon in Daniel 7 had ten horns, which were ten kings. And the beast of Revelation 13 had ten horns, which were ten kings. That was pagan Rome, the Germanic tribes that rose and broke up the pagan Roman Empire. Those were the ten kings. But it says that among those kings in Daniel 7 arose a little horn, which we talked about in our previous study. This little horn here we found out to be the papal Rome. You remember we identified the little horn and we found out that this beast of Revelation 13 is also Papal Rome. So the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13 are exactly the same power. So now we have five heads. Let's look at them. We have the lion, which is Babylon, the bear, Medo Persia, the leopard, Greece, the dragon, Pagan Rome. In Revelation 13, we now have the fifth one, the fifth head, 
and this is the beast that had the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and the body of a leopard, and it has seven heads. So we find these things are being fulfilled step by step. In our next study, we will be looking at the beast that gave birth to four men and taking yet another step in these amazing prophecies. You and I are coming on down step by step through prophecy and we are finding that prophecy is being fulfilled day by day and that you and I can study it and see where we're going. And as we study, God will reveal it so that we know exactly where we are. You see, you and I are living in the time that the scripture refers to as the latter days. The days in which scripture says that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. A day when we will see all the prophecies in scripture that have been foretold, fulfilled. Certainly, in times like these, you and I need an anchor. We need to hang on to Jesus Christ, to the word of God, and he will lead us directly into the kingdom of heaven. Will you be ready? Mm -hmm.